Good morning, everyone. Today's presentation is about Montenegro, one of the hottest and most contested issue in Montenegrin politics, culture, and life in general. It is about the identity politics and the literary works of the Montenegrin national poet Petar Petrovic Njegos. I have uh, entitle this talk tentatively Writing the Nation. As we know, on May the 21st, 2006, the citizens of Montenegro voted in favor of their country becoming independent and sovereign once again. A reminder of a historical fact, the Kingdom of Montenegro was annexed by Serbia in November of 1918 and it disappeared into the newly formed Kingdom of the Serbs, Croats and Slovenes. The awkward state structure that emerged some decades later, called the Union of Serbia and Montenegro, disappeared from the political stage following the referendum on the 21st of May 2006, and the process of fragmentation of the former Yugoslavia entered its final phase. Uh, for many citizens of Montenegro, <clears throat> favoring the independentist option was a rebirth of a nation, in a sense. Those supporting union with the neighboring Serbia regarded the outcome of the referendum on independence <coughs> pardon me, as an act of national betrayal uh, and a further deepening of a significant political fault lines within the country. Uh, those were by no means new division lines. Since 1918, Montenegrin political landscape has been shaped by the struggle between the so-called independentists or Greens and unionists or whites. In the spring of 2006, these ghosts from the past were called upon for what was promising to be the final political face-off. Both camps in the 2006 referendum campaign displayed a considerable mastery in utilizing the events and personalities from the Montenegrin history to advance their vision, or their visions rather, of the country's future. The tradition of epic poetry fell prey to the high political appetites of both the great Serbian nationalists and their Montenegrin counterparts. Both sides worked hard on promulgating different versions or different interpretations of the past, and in particular a literary canon that represented their own understanding of national unity in Montenegro. Following the well-known model of homogenization, national heroes and national villains once again animated the public sphere. Uh, my talk today addresses the manner <clears throat> in which uh, proponents of the Greater Serbian and the Montenegrin nationalisms appropriated the works of the 19th century Montenegrin ruler and poet, Prince Bishop, Metropolitan Petar Drugi Petrovic Njegos. I will try to illustrate both how and to what extent was his literary work utilized by those advancing a particular nationalist agenda in Montenegro over the last several decades. On a more general level, this is a story about the relationship between literature and politics, and about the construction of memory. It is also a confirmation of the view that we are what we remember, indeed. My own views on nations and nationalism and identity construction processes have been influenced in great measure by writings of Benedict Anderson, Eric Hobsbawm, Ernest Gellner and other modernists. I see the nation as a, quote, state of mind, whose members belong to it because they think they do. Petar II Petrovic Njegos is the most venerated historical personality in Montenegro. He ruled the country in the early 19th century and authored its national epic, the Mountain Reed. He was the monk and the warrior, a scholar and a tribal chieftain. He was a poet who dreamt about a common South Slavic state. He opened the first school in Montenegro and brought to its capital, Cetinje, the very first symbol 
of the Western culture and modernity, a billiard table. For the Montenegrin nationalists, Petr II Petrovich Njegos is Montenegro. The two are reflected in each other's mirrors and interconnected to the point of inseparability. So any attempt to write about Njegos and his literary work is simultaneously an attempt to write about Montenegro, its history and the identities of its people. The significance and meaning of his literary legacy is a hotly contested issue, and both nationalist camps in Montenegro claim Njegos as their own national poet. They argue over questions of Montenegrin state having been only, quote, a peripheral extension of Serbia or an independent and recognizable entity. The Serb nationalists write books attempting to prove that Montenegrins have always been an integral part of a Serbian, broader Serbian ethnic framework, or as they call them, the best of Serbs, that ended up isolated from the nation's nucleus due to unfortunate historical circumstance. Montenegrin nationalists, for their part, respond with books arguing in favor of Montenegro's distinctiveness and linking it to the Roman province of Prevalis, thus attempting to create historical continuity with non-Serb and even a non-Slavic proto-state formation from distant past. The most, vitrio pardon me, <clears throat> the most vitriolic debates have been about Njegor's ethnic uh, or national designation. Was he a Serbian or a Montenegrin poet? So one wonders if it is at all possible to talk about identities of people of Montenegro independent of an all-inclusive Serbian paradigm and outside the canonized binary opposition of Serb versus Montenegrin identity. All of the available historical sources do not provide a clear answer to any of the above-mentioned questions. The initial contact and later mixing and intermarrying of Slavs with the indigenous population of the Balkans blurred the lines and prevent clear-cut ethnic distinction. However, it is possible to make a distinction between Montenegrins and Serbs in terms of their independent political histories, their traditions, customs, moral codes and elements that best define social cultures of their respective societies. What envelops this multi-layered character of Montenegrin identity or identities, if you wish, and impedes a more complete understanding of Montenegrin history is, among other things, its tradition of epic poetry, the contents of which are open to various and often conflicting interpretations. To adopt the metaphor of Slavoj Žižek, one could say that epic poetry in Montenegro, unlike the role it plays in other societies, is the stuff others' dreams are made of. The political dimension of Montenegrin identity is best illustrated by numerous and contradictory interpretations of the literary achievements of Petar II Petrovich Njegos. His legacy serves as telling example of how literature, religion and politics in the Balkans can be interwoven in serving particular political agendas. His work has been appropriated by both supporters and opponents of a distinct Montenegrin national and cultural identity. Each group managed to find enough evidence in Njegor's literary work to advance their own political vision of Montenegro. By the end of the 19th century, the debate about Njegor's sense of national identity developed into a debate about national and cultural identity of Montenegrins. Metropolitan Petr II Petrovic Njegor and he was, an, as I said, he was the 19th century ruler of Montenegro, and his poetic endeavors occupy central stage in the South Slavic myth-making factory. His magnum opus is his epic poem, The Mountain Reed, written in 1846 in Cetinje, then the capital, and published in Vienna a year later in 1847. Uh, the poem appeared in print in the same year as Vuk Stefanovic Karadžić's translation of the New Testament. According to Professor Vasa Mihailovic, whose English translation of the Mountain Reed was published in Belgrade in 1997 by the Serbian Europe Publishing, 
Niegos, quote, is revered as Montenegro's most illustrious son and the greatest poet in Serbian literature, end of quote. The mountain reed is set in late 17th century Montenegro and deals with the attempts of Njegor's ancestor, Metropolitan Danilo, to both regulate relations among the region's warring tribes, on the one hand, and shield its small domain from an overwhelming Ottoman influence. Njegor constructed his poem around a single event that allegedly took place on a particular Christmas day in the early 1700s, during Metropolitan Danilo's rule. And the event was mass execution of Montenegrins who had converted to Islam. The dating of the alleged event is a matter of some controversy. The sub subtitle of the mountain read tells us that the poem deals with, quote, a historical event from the end of the 17th century, end of quote. The same dating of the event described in the mountain wreath appeared in a number of histories of Montenegro published during the 19th century, such as those published by, written by Sima Milutinovic Saraylia, published in Belgrade in 1835, and Dmitry Milakovic, published in Zadar in 1856. Later studies of the mountain wreath by Reshetar, 1890, Ilarion Ruvaras, 1899, and Stojanovic in 1903 based their dating of the event on a note allegedly written by the Metropolitan Danilo Petrovic himself. The note and its commentary by Mussolini were published in a journal called Glasnik in 1836. It is worth pointing out that Ilario Rubarac expressed serious concerns regarding the genuine character of this note, but his concerns were quickly brushed aside by a number of local historians. The above-mentioned authors offered three different dates for the so-called Christmas Day Massacre, three different years rather, 1702, 1704 and 1707. While the mountain reed positioned the event in the late 17th century, it is interesting to note that in his early works Njegos dated the event in 1702. In one of his earlier poems, called Ogledalo Srpsko, Njegos wrote about the event and positioned it around the year 1702. A notable exception to all this is Konstantin Jiricek, or was Konstantin Jiricek, rather, who, in his book Naučni Slovnik, stated that the event described in the mountain reed never took place. The history of Montenegro, published by Litera in Belgrade, however, tells us that, quote, at the dawn of the 18th century in 1707, an event occurred in Montenegro known as the liquidation of the converts of Islam, Islamicized Christians. Its initiator was Bishop Danilo Šepčević, later Petrovic, the event itself was highly localized in character. It happened in the clan of the Čeklići. But, from the historical point of view, it marked the beginning of a process which would continue throughout the 18th century and end with the disappearance of converts. End of quote. Regarding the claim uh, about the disappearance of converts, it suffices to say for now that at present, some 16% of the Montenegrin population is of the Islamic faith, and that Montenegrins of the Islamic faith have been constantly present in the region. Naturally, one should not overlook the demographic changes that have occurred in Montenegro over the past couple of centuries, but those movements of population can hardly amount to the disappearance of converts. Moreover, Montenegrins of the Islamic faith and their socio-cultural heritage are currently an integral part and have been for some decades of the general matrix of Montenegrin society. Regardless of their political agendas, ideological preferences or religious affiliation, every new generation of South Slav historians and politicians appropriates Njegos and his work hoping to find enough quotations to validate their own uh, views. 
Furthermore, in every translation of the mountain read in English, one can detect attempts to remodel the original. The most often cited English translation of his poetry was published in 1997 and represents another attempt to colonize Njegor's work for the sake of aiding modern political and ideological struggle in the Balkans. The translator of the, of the work used the English word nation for the local word pleme, which means tribe, thus ascribing to Njegor's terminology he never used in the mountain wreath. I will read you the quote in the original language and then the English translation. Mado žito navijaj klasove, pređe roka došla ti je žnjetva, divne žertve vidim na gomile, pred oltarom crkve i plemena. Ripen young wheat and corn into the grain. Your harvest has arrived before its time. I see precious offerings piled up high at the altar of our church and nation. So the word nation here changes the entire meaning of the poem and also ascribes a particular understanding of what the population of Montenegro constituted at the time. Using the term nation instead of tribe altered the semantics of the poem, as I said, and alluded to the existence of the direct link between Njegor's work and the issue of Serb identity. It also implied that characters from Njegor's poem taught in national terms. In turn, such implying reaffirms standard reading of the mountain read that is conditioned by the ideological confines of the Serb national paradigm. But that is a tale of a different poem. This poem by Njegos is praised and criticized at the same time. Many Serbian nationalists use it as a historical justification for their attempt to keep alive their dream of greater Serbia and as the ultimate proof of the Serb identity of Montenegrins. Let us briefly return to Njegos translator, who says, quote, the mountain reed represents a synthesis in another sense as well. It is based on historical facts, thus it can be called a historical play. It epitomizes the spirit of the Serbian people kept alive for centuries. Indeed, there is no other literary work within with which the Serbs identify more." End of quote. Some Croatian nationalists recognize in Njegor's poetry the ultimate statement of the oriental nature of South Slavs living east of the Drina River, thus reinforcing the popular notion of a stereotypical other. Many people in Bosnia and Herzegovina view the mountain reed as a manual for ethnic cleansing, fratricidal murder and genocide. Montenegrin nationalists largely shy away from any interpretation of Njegor's poetry and only on occasion discuss its literary and linguistic merits. Instead, they focus on his state-building efforts. In spite of the openness of this work to various interpretations, or precisely because of it, one should not forget that the fact that uh, what one is reading is a work of literature. I'm not suggesting, of course, that literature should not be approached as a source for evaluating any given historical period, or that our contemporaries have no right to 19th century reading of Njegos. On the contrary, literature is a litmus test for the deeper understanding of a particular historical period, but its exclusive usage as the primary and sole determining element in the process of historical evaluation across time is indeed a questionable methodological approach, to say the least. I would like to propose reading Njegor's Mountain Read as a tale of a long lost, or long gone rather, a heroic tribal society that was poeticized in order to depict the state of affairs in Njegor's Montenegro. With this in mind, I believe that his work could be approached as an additional source for assessing the conditions within a particular time frame in Montenegrin history, which is Njegor's time, the first half of the 19th century. The long gone Montenegro that Njegor wrote about had little in common with the Montenegro of his time and has nothing in common with the contemporary Montenegro. <clears throat> However, the mountain reads does speak volumes about political, social, cultural 
and economic conditions in Montenegro during the early 19th century, and about Njegor's efforts to advocate the ideas of Pan-Slavism and the Illyrian movement. The early 1840s in Montenegro were years of drought, hunger, and the ever-present threat of Ottoman invasion, for many Montenegrins converting to Islam meant having access to grain, and thus being able to save their extended families from starvation. Despite the difficulty of proving that an event of such magnitude and in such a manner as described by Njegos, the killing of Montenegrins who had converted to Islam, ever took place, the prevailing attitude is to approach Njegos's poem as a somewhat poeticized <clears throat> version of a historical event of this kind. A lack of historical sources related to this issue has not prevented the misreads misreadings of and misuse of Njegor's poetry. One comes across statements that claim intimate knowledge of the Metropolitan's private thoughts and that emphasizes Njegor's personal animosity towards Islam. Quote, By unleashing his wrath against the indigenous Slavic Muslims, Njegor displays his personal hatred of Islam. End of quote. The fact that the victim or victims in the mountain wheat were depicted as converts to Islam, was not taken as a reflection upon the socio-political conditions in Montenegro during Njegor's time, but as an easy explanation for those who believe that a deeply embedded hatred towards Islam exists in Njegor's and in Montenegro. In Njegor's work, I was unable to find an instance that would indicate his personal hatred towards any group of people, or towards any religion. Njegos did not hate the quote-unquote Turks as a nation or the religious religion of Islam, and he did not hate individuals in Montenegro who converted to Islam. On the contrary, he managed to find rather sophisticated ways of euphemizing the fact of the conversion to Islam, attributing it to the difficult historical circumstances and harsh living conditions in Montenegro. It is almost as though he were absolving the converts of their guilt by saying, and I'll read the original and English translation, Da, nijesu ni krivi toliko, prema mi ih nevjera na vjeru, ulovi ih u mrežu džavolju, šta je čovjek ka slabo živinče. It may not be the turncoat's fault as much. The infidel enticed them with falsehood and entangled them in the devil's net. But what is a man, in truth, a weak creature? Njegos was angry because, together with other Montenegrins, he was forced to wage a constant battle for survival of the Montenegrin state, its freedom, its traditions and culture against the much stronger opponent. The, he generally condemned the urge to conquer others, regardless of what particular group, in this particular case the Ottomans, practiced such methods. So for him, the Islamization of Montenegrins represented the initial stage in the process of dissolving the traditional socio-cultural values that are so typical for Montenegro. And he condemns the converts for not being conscious of that fact. Based on various readings or misreadings of the mountain read, many scholars have tried to justify their theories about the historical continuity of Montenegrin's violence towards others. This quote-unquote character trait is then presented as a determining factor in Montenegrin history. What escapes their attention is the crucial difference between the concept of being violent and that of becoming violent. Making this distinction will open up new interpretations of Montenegrin history. Such a change in analytical approach constitutes a new discourse that is concerned more with uh, the aspects of the process of becoming violent than with the focus on violence and hatred as central features of Montenegrin character. Of course, one could talk about Njegos, the politician, who fought against Ottoman rule all his life, but this struggle should not be taken as a hatred of Islam. Njegor's correspondence with neighboring Ottoman officials show that the Metropolitan displayed a surprisingly relaxed attitude towards his political and military enemies. 
One need only to be reminded also of the verses from the mountain read about Istanbul and Islam. O Stambole, zemaljsko veselje, kupo meda, goro od šećera, banjo slatka ljudskoga života, gdje se vile u šerbet kupaju, o Stambole, svečeva palato, istočniče sile i svetinje, Bog iz tebe samo begemiše, čez proroka sa zemljom vladati, šta će mene od tebe odbiti? O Istanbul, earthly delight and joy, a cup of honey, a mountain of sugar, the sweetest spa of human existence, where the women bathe in honeyed sherbet. O Istanbul, palace of the prophet, the source of his power and his holy shrine, it is Allah's pleasure to rule the earth only from the palace of the prophet. What can ever separate me from you? It is not easy to find a better, more poetic depiction of both the Islamic faith and the Sultan's city in the entire corpus of South Slavic epic poetry. As for the population of Montenegro, one can say that until the present day, outside political manipulations, Montenegrins have not cared much about issues of religious and national differences, not even in the early 19th century. Quote, A Montenegrin does not have any national prejudice. He is very eager to adopt good things from others if these are not in conflict with his basic principles and his natural inclinations. He easily establishes communication with the foreign re foreigners regardless of religion and nationality. This is Pavel Apolonovich Robinsky, the Russian ethnographer who traveled through Montenegro and then wrote a book about those travels. The late professor Edward Dennis Goy, a scholar at Cambridge University, and the author of a book The Sabre and the Song, Njegor's The Mountain Read, took an interesting approach in analyzing segments of this poem. For example, in his poem Njegor described the following episode. Mujo Alic, the Turkish chief of guards, had run away with Ruja, Kassan's wife, and fled with her and his youngest brother. More than a year, perhaps it has been now since those two put their heads together. It sounds like kidnapping. Professor Goy interprets this episode in which Ruja, the wife of Kassan, both of the Eastern Orthodox faith, left her husband to run away with Muyo Alic, a convert to Islam, as a kidnapping and goes on to explain that this type of event was a common criminal practice associated with Islamicized Montenegrins of the period. Moreover, Professor Goy then projects this negative stereotyping forward in time in order to reach the startling conclusion that, quote, when one considers modern Islam and its taking of hostages and murder, one may wonder whether it is not a characteristic of the faith, end of quote. The fact that one often finds accounts of the hostage-taking of Muslim women by Orthodox Christian outlaws, Hajduks, and their conversion to the Christian faith, usually depicted by the following verse from Haikuna He Makes Angelia, od Haikune Pravi Angeliu, in both Serbian and Montenegrin epic poetry, does not figure at all in Professor Goy's analysis. By the way, the term Hajduk has a complex structure whose semantics have, a vary, have varied in time and dependent on constantly shifting power relations in the Balkans. According to the new Encyclopedia Britannica, during the Ottoman rule in the region, Hajduks were called individuals accused of crimes or, protecting, or pro protesting injustice, which would then characteristically head for the hills or forests to lead the life of, of the Hajduk or outlaw. Both of these forms of resistance increased from the 17th century. And the quote, Morton Benson defined them as anti-Turkish highwaymen, while the Encyclopedia Yugoslavia stated that Hajducia, living the life of Hajduks, during the Turkish period it had the form of and character of highway robbery. Among the South Slavs, and particularly among Serbs and Montenegrins, 
This activity acquired additional meaning in the late 18th and early 19th centuries and became viewed as a form of social unrest and national or political struggle against Ottoman rule. In Montenegro, such resistance, so-called Haiduchia, also represented a form of war economy because small bands of Haiduks often looted the states of neighboring Muslim landowners. Haiduks in Serbia and Montenegro played a different role in their respective societies and their motives for heading for the hills were different from those of Haidus in 15th and 16th century Hungary. Again, New Encyclopedia Britannica tells us that Haidus were, quote, Magyar and Slav foot soldiers who fought for Istvan or Stephen Boschke in 1557-1606, Prince of Transylvania. This militarized population called Haiduk or brigand or bandit by the Turks were granted lands, privileges and title exemptions by the Prince of Transylvania. So after reading these and other similar statements about Njegor's poetry, I am convinced that this dead poet has few readers and that misunderstandings more often than not spring out from every word of his verse. Despite the persistent return of many scholars to Njegor's writing, it seems that his epic poem The Mountain Reed still remains unread as literature. Moreover, extant sources indicate that the episode about Ruža Kasanova and Mujo Alic that I previously described might be yet another example of Njegor's reshaping a segment of a mythologized past that was preserved in the popular memory. In the article entitled Ruža Kasanova, published in a monthly called Bosanska Vila in 1895, Ivan Jurovic retold the legend about a Montenegrin man named Vukman, Eastern Orthodox, who lived on the slopes of Mount Lovčin. The legend tells us that his wife, Jela, abandoned him and went away with the Pasha from Podgorica named Abdović. The legend also speaks about Jela's love for the Pasha and her wish to live with him rather than stay with her husband. Vukman's brothers then went after them alongside the creek called Pištet, and killed them both on the mountain called Simunya. It is interesting to note that the story told in the mountain reed bears a striking similarity to this legend, and that the entire episode described by Njegos takes place on those same locations. The myth of the slaying of infidels in early 18th century Montenegro is a recurring theme in almost all analysis of the region's history and the mentality of its people. Its usage as the ultimate explanation for the recent historical developments in the region is apparent and particularly troubling. Apart from being a material mistake, the employment of this team serves the purpose of further restraining Montenegro within the confines of the notions of the so-called ancient hatred, irrationalism and barbarism. So what I will try to do is provide a brief account of my findings related to the alleged massacre of Montenegrin Muslims as described in the Mountain Reed. The most significant source related to this popular myth in Montenegrin history is a medieval document called the Book of Medojevina, an account of church property in Cetinje that is part of a larger collection of documents known as the Cetinje Chronicle. The Book of Medojevina consists of two documents. Sworn statements by two brothers, Petar and Vukosav Medojevic. The first statement was dated April 25, 1733 in the Cetinje Monastery, while the second was written 15 years later in 1748. Both documents deal with an earlier conflict over a large property that the Medojevic, an old Montenegrin Eastern Orthodox family, whose members had worked as blacksmiths for the Cetinje Monastery since 1485, had had with the church authorities. According to the documents during the rule of Metropolitan Danilo, the family had refused to vacate the property and return it to the church 
in spite of the loud objections of local priests, tribal leaders and the metropolitan himself. The conflict over property escalated to the point that leaders of various Montenegrin tribes gathered in Setinje to discuss a course of action, even though Metropolitan Danilo half-heartedly tried to defuse the dangerous situation. A number of Montenegrins went on to destroy the Medoevich house and burn all their possessions, burn down all their possessions. Tribal leaders decided to expel the family. However, the Medoevich refused to leave and resettled on the same property once again, in spite of the collective decision on the part of the tribal leaders to expel them from Cetinje, and in spite of a curse put upon them by the Metropolitan himself. Both documents tells us also that in the course of the next decade, the Medoevich, who had previously been a large family, dwindled to only two adult members. Both documents mention childless wives in the family. Pero and Vukosa Medoevich then decided to seek forgiveness from the Metropolitan, and asked him to lift the curse, and they also gave back the property to the Cetinje monastery. In essence, both of those documents depict a conflict between the ruler of Montenegro and the Medoevich, which spiraled out of control and in time became an important segment of local tradition. The Montenegrin oral tradition reshaped and redefined this conflict between the ruler and his subordinates into the myth of the killing of converts. This was accomplished by resorting to the notion of guilty by imagined association, namely the popular oral tradition connected to conflict between the Medoevich and the Metropolitan from 1704 to the case of a number of Montenegrins who were together with Stanisz Atsernojevich forcefully converted to Islam in 1485. In time, the popular memory positioned the confrontation over the property from 1704 in the same category as the imagined conflict between the Orthodox Metropolitan and the converts. Both events, one from 1485 and one from 1704, shared an important feature. The taking away of land from the Cetinje monastery. And the popular memory equated the two groups, characterizing them as traitors. So, the fight over property between the ruler and the Medoevich, its aftermath, and the Metropolitan's curse in particular, resonated strongly in the popular imagination. And the story was remembered and retold as an example of a traumatic event. During the first half of the 19th century, this event entered the literature and was refurbished with significant new meanings. The Medoevich became the Turks, and the property dispute, as well as the expulsion of this family from Cetinje, entered the realm of national mythology as the grand theme of the killing of converts. It is indicative that there are no written sources related to the killing of converts, dated before the early 19th century. The first Montenegrin historian, Metropolitan Vasilije Petrovich Njegos, in his History of Montenegro, printed in St. Petersburg in 1745, fails to mention anything remotely resembling the organized mass killings of converts. Moreover, he does not make a reference to Islamicized Montenegrins at all. Such attitude of the Metropolitan was understandable, given his urge to portray Montenegro as the focal point of the anti-Ottoman struggle in the region and as a country whose main historical feature was its permanent struggle against an invader. Another historical text about Montenegro, the short description of Zeta and Montenegro from 1774, did not mention either the event itself or the existence of converts in Montenegro. The first mention of this ultimate crime, Magnum Crimen, appears in a poem by the Montenegrin rural metropolitan Peter I, Njegor's predecessor, which was published in 1833. He revisited the issue in his short history of Montenegro that first appeared in, 13, in sorry, 1835 
in the journal Grlica in Cetinje. Peter I wrote about the killing of converts in Montenegro during the time of his predecessor, Metropolitan Daniel, 1700s, but did not offer any context for that event, and also failed to elaborate on its causes, its dynamics, or the individuals involved. Njegoš's teacher and mentor, Sima Milutinović Sarailija, used this motive in his history of Montenegro because he thought it necessary to add significance to the role of the Petrovic dynasty in the history of Montenegro. Milutinović's book appeared in print in Belgrade in 1835. Regarding the killing of converts, Milutinović provided numerous details that were adopted from epic poems, and it would be safe to say that his account was a both poeticized and mythologized version of Montenegrin history. It is notable that the earlier work of Milorad Medaković, such as Povjesnica Crne Gore od najstarijih remena do 1830, printed in Zemun in 1850, does not mention the killing of converts at all. Almost 50 years later, however, in his book entitled Vladika Danilo, the Metropolitan Danilo, published in 1896, Medakovic adopt, adopted a different stand, sorry, adopted a different stand, and wrote extensively on the event attempting to prove its existence. The turning point in the debate about the killing of converts came with a new book by Dmitry Milakovic that was published in 1856. He described the event as a historical fact and provided numerous details about personalities involved, even though his account can easily be categorized as yet another remaking of mythologized past, his work cemented the dogma of the organized extermination of Islamicized Montenegrins during the rule of Metropolitan Danilo that lasts to this very day. The reality might be completely different. Njegoš adopted the motive and began developing it in his early works. Finally, in the mountain read and in accordance to the ideology of his time, Njegoš elevated this incident, preserved it, preserved in the popular memory, and he also reshaped it to the level of the struggle for preservation of Montenegrin freedom, heritage, and Eastern Orthodox faith. One can see a connection between the image of the early Medojevic as traitors, converts, embedded in the popular memory and the characters in the mountain read, Haji Ali Medović Kadija and Skender Beg Medović in Njegor's mountain read, sounds suspiciously similar to Medojevic's brothers. Available sources point out that Njegor did not base his poem on a historical event. However, he realized the potential significance of a reshaped myth and through licentia poetica actualized its meaning. The myth of the slaying of converts as an act of cleansing and the indication of a fresh start meshed very nicely with Njegor's efforts to turn Montenegro into a modern state. So with this in mind, I would like to propose yet another way of reading the, Monteneg the mountain read. The reading of an epic poem about a new beginning. As we know, all myths about a new beginning are variations of a story about horrible crimes being committed, especially by killing of the innocent and the killing of relatives. Very often it is a story of twin brothers, Cain and Abel, for example, a dramatic setting where blood relation makes the crime almost unimaginable and therefore highly symbolic. The initial crime committed in Montenegro, the crime that signifies its birth, is the extinction of brothers. It is, to use the contemporary lingo, a civil war. So, the beginning is tragedy. It is the destruction of everything that is and the collapse of the fundamental taboos that regulate the life of an individual and a society. It is the final departure from a past life, past way of life, 
and its radical alteration. It seems as if Njegoš adopted and then adapted the logic of the Old Testament related to total annihilation of the enemy. And let me read you a quote from the Old Testament. And if it is true, and it has been proved, that this detestable thing has been done among you, you must certainly put to the sword all who live in that town, destroy it completely, both its people and its livestock, gather all the plunder of the town into the middle of the public square and completely burn the town and all its plunder as a whole burnt offering to the Lord your God. It is to remain a ruin forever, never to be rebuilt. End of quote. So, in the beginning is the crime of all crimes. The crime for which there is no justification, since it denounces all accepted values and modes of life. After such a crime, only two solutions are left. The death, the death of the guilty or the construction of an entire new identity. Something so new that the process will last as long as it is necessary for the guilty to repent or be erased altogether. It seems to me that what Njegos, the politician, was trying to accomplish was precisely this, homogenization of Montenegrin tribes in accordance with the concept of national awakening, the restructuring of a tribal society into a nation. <clears throat> in other words, the construction of a new identity. Such a process is painful and calls for sacrifices. But that was the essence of Njegor's politics, to destroy the old tribal Montenegro and create a modern state. He was destroying it because it was impossible to reform the tribal heroic society in which he lived. Because of the scope of the crime, one can only seek forgiveness in extremes. To succeed in the attempt or to perish forever. So both Njegos and the Metropolitan Danilo from the poem seem painfully aware of the terrible choices, but opt for violence as the only way to recreate their being in a new environment. Neka bude što biti ne može, nek ad proždre pokosi satana, na groblju će iznići cvijeće za daleko neko pokoljenje. Let it be what men thought could never be. Let hell devour, let Satan cut us down. Flowers will sprout and grow on our graveyards for some distant future generation. End of quote. So the mountain reed is an important literary achievement, and it should be analyzed as a drama that confronts and challenges the concepts of thought and action morality and righteousness, religion and human nature, and not only and exclusively as the poeticized version of a historical event. It is a poetic tale written by a man who continuously deconstructs and questions the very world he lives in. Moreover, the character of Njegor's work is far from one-dimensional and cannot in good conscience be viewed exclusively as national literature because it deals with issues much, much broader than the narrow margins of Montenegrin political and cultural space. Furthermore, the mountain read should not be read outside the context of the time of its inception, nor from the perspective of one book. And I'll close with the reminder of Dan Lokesh's statement, many books are not dangerous, but one book is. Thank you.